All right, guys, we're going to get started. I think. Yep. All right, so today is kind of the last lecture. Oh, kids. Yeah, so today is the last, last lecture, basically. Um, kind of, right, going over theory, a little bit of the last concepts of theory. Um, and, yeah. So on Thursday, uh, hope, uh, I'm hoping to finish the theory today uh, and just give you guys time on Thursday to like help you out if you have any issues or anything like that. Uh, I'll remind you of what is uh, you know, due currently, right? And then we have presentations next week, right? So we're just gonna do that. So the Cypher 10 challenge is gonna be next week, right? Um, and also the project is going to be due next week, right? So what you have to do, as I said, with the project, pick the simplest data set that you can find. You can even go back to one of the data sets you've already used. But of course, you have to train a model. Please don't use Iris, use something else. Um, but it doesn't have to be super complicated. And then just basically go through the exercise of training it, getting some scores, so you know, performance, deploying it with Onyx. I provided all that code already all the links, deploy the Onyx model, build a JavaScript application on GitHub, and then show evidence that you put in two values and you get a class or something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, please. It needs to be a neural network if we can't do a KNN. Yeah, because then you're thinking of, it. So, so if you think of KNN, you're thinking of PyScript and the KNN oh, averaging okay. task. But this time around, I want you to deploy a neural network. So you could deploy a, a chat GPT of your own if you wanted to, right? But that's a lot of work. Just deploy something simple. I provided some examples of how to load images. If you decide to do images, right? The code is provided there. You can use the camera for sign language, things like that. Or do something similar like in the wine quality data set, for instance. I think that's the one I provided. I can't remember. But yeah. Does that make sense? Are there any questions about that? So if you have any issues with that assignment on Thursday, I will help you or see me during office hours, okay? But that's kind of the task. If you're stuck with SciFAR 10, uh, that's also a challenge. So, and then presentations will be kind of, you know, next week, Tuesday and Thursdays as they come. So whatever you want to show first, we're not really, yeah, go ahead. What is the Oh yeah, the final exam should be on during finals week, which is gonna and it would be on a Tuesday, probably at seven from seven to nine. That's the time that they assigned us. You can always uh, find out just by going on Google, and you can Google PNW final exam schedule, which is usually what I do, and go into final exam schedule, and then it tells you, so this class meets Tuesday at 6 p.m. Tuesday at 6. Yeah, that's what I thought. So usually then you can confirm there Tuesday, the class meets at 6, then the exam is Tuesday from 7.15 to 9.15 p.m. It's what they, and I can't change that at all. All right, so that's basically the what the university mandates. Um, and so we're going to have the final exam. Uh, it's comprehensive, so it's going to include everything from the beginning of the semester until the end. Today, you know, and that's basically, those are the three things that you have left of the semester. Any questions? Yeah, please, sir. So for, those are the times we'll be at the class. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, the exam is 7.15 to 9.15 here oh, yes. yeah. in this. Yeah, it's closed notes, but you're allowed your cheat sheet and basically the same idea. Hmm? Yes, it's comprehensive. So everything, anything from the beginning of the semester until what we've covered today, basically. Yeah, please. For the exam, 7.15 is when it starts, actually. Um, I mean, I usually get here at seven and I'll start it as soon as I load it. So we can start earlier, but it, I definitely need to keep the window of your submission open between seven and nine fifteen. 
questions? Any other questions? Everyone clear? So that's what you have left, right? Those two mini projects basically and the exam, okay? Um, so Sci-Fi 10, uh, if you guys are, you know, some suggestions, if you're having issues with not getting good performance with GPU, run it on your laptop. Leave it running for a few days. Hopefully it won't burn your, uh, <laughs> Here, but I mean, remember, it's not just limited to GPU. It, that code will run on CPU on your laptop. It's just going to take a uh, long time. Yes, sir, Mark. Will it run despite not having a CUDA? Yes, that's what I'm saying. The code works CPU or GPU. That's why it's got that it, that little logic at the top. So if you don't, if you decide not to use GPU or can't use GPU, you can just run it on your laptop. And let it, but definitely be prepared though to let it run for a few days, definitely overnight, and don't kill it. But keep the checkpoints going. Just don't save every five epics, maybe you know. And then you can always retrieve from a checkpoint, and save that. Save a good checkpoint for the presentations. Okay, try to you know. I can tell you that I provided the CNN code, I believe, and and you should be able to get in the point seven range. You don't have to win the competition, but just show that you did something, right? Any questions about that? Yeah, Henry. I'm gonna win. Yeah, <laughs> I bet you. Uh, Quentin, are you? Uh, have you made any improvements to your model? Yeah. You haven't had time. Aiden. Uh, I've heard what they have, and I'm not there yet. Not there yet. Any of you uh, run on GPU smoothly, besides Henry? Some of you, have you tried GPU so far? Yeah. yeah. Is what? Consistent point two. Consistent point two, yeah. So keep in mind. Oh, yeah, it's actually, some of the reasons how it's actually messing up the reports. Oh, it's the high stock stress today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so. Five installers landing on my CPU, I got up to the Yeah, I. This is true, That's and I apologize. This is true, and I apologize about this. Henry and I have been working on this for days, and we can't. We cannot figure out. I'm gonna run my code on my CPU because I got yeah. like nine. And I on... we've run that code on yeah. on other GPUs, and it runs perfectly fine. What's a good alternative? So that's what I was saying. So if you cannot get. A GPU, just run it on CPU and, and get the best that you can, unfortunately. Run the CNN. It might be run a little bit faster than a, a DLNet. Yeah. So how is the grading going to work for the side part? Just do it. I mean, the, the, the trick is just, I wanted, didn't want to tell you this, but just do it. Show that you did it. It's not that you have to get, but the trophy, though, the coveted trophy yes, that that goes to the winner. <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, I I obviously don't grade based on the score that you achieve, but the trophy that I assign is based on the whole point of the exercise is to try everything and try to improve that score. I mean, the reality is when you use cloud GPUs, you're gonna have problems, right? But definitely, I I don't. I mean, Henry, who's an expert in this and worked and can't find the error. I can't find the error. And so we're trying to, with West Lafayette, to figure out what's going. Okay. So other, I will suggest other alternatives for those of you that like to learn new things. Although, you know, although I don't like to endorse products, Google Colab is an alternative. It runs PyTorch. I believe if you just subscribe quick, you know, the first time around, it's free after that it might charge you a little bit of money so you can try google collab if you would like i can speak on that one too yeah go ahead so you only get 10 hours free a month yeah so, and that's like on the machine so if you're going to do collab do all of your coding on the cpu and then you can change your runtime server to the gpu because like just idle time counts and if you do want the subscription it's 10 bucks a month and that gets you 100 compute hours yeah, so it's not too good. Yeah, thank you. Exactly. Yeah. So if you know Google, uh, sorry, um, Produce Scholar is supposed to be great, but I, I guess we're still having some bugs with it. 
but there are alternatives. Google Colab is, just give me a second. It's definitely Google Colab is what a lot of people will use. And, you know, if you go out in, in industry, you'll, you'll see people using it. There is also, um, uh, I think it's called, let me, let me, give me a second. It's Lightning Studio, I think it's called. Yeah, Lightning AI, right, Lightning AI, who are the creators of PyTorch Lightning. So they have something called Lightning Studio. And it's a type of a Py, it's, a, it's like a collab, but more PyTorch from, the, from that group, okay? So that's another alternative that you guys, that should be lightning.ai, right? So it's probably the same business model, a little bit free at first. And then, um, so you can try those, um, you know, there's obviously AWS and things like that. Henry, go ahead. Um, one of the things you would probably test is try training on the scholar and testing it on your own GPU. Yep. So I can, and then, and yeah, it still did the 0.05 on your CPU. Okay, and then, okay, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, no, I know, I mean, it, it runs fine on, G, like on my local GPU at home, it works fine, fine. Some of you have GPUs that work, they are actually the ones that reported to me this first, and we just haven't found the issue, so. And at the end of the day, run it on your laptop. I mean, it should be able to, in a couple of days, three days maybe, <laughs> you'll get some okay risk. I it, it won't give you any bugs. I'm pretty sure it'll give you good scores. Yeah. Does your home GPU have two options? Yes. So I have, yeah, exactly. So I have, some of us have actual GPU boxes at home, like for gaming and things like that. So if you have an, I have an, an old NVIDIA RTX 2080, but those are workhorses that work really well. No problem. So the code definitely runs. I, I ran it 500 epics and I achieved 0.71. Uh, F measure, so you can get yeah, how long? Five hundred epics. So oh, on a GPU that takes like less than an hour. Mine's a hundred epics. Yeah, Henry's got some some serious uh, computing and an algorithm as well. <laughs> I don't do that with metrics. Yeah, so definitely, I would say probably Colab is the thing to try. Lightning AI also. Try those out. I don't think it would be that hard to get going with those. Quentin, what are you using? Use your laptop? No, I'm using the scholar. And you achieve what score? One six. Okay, you you heard so the I conversation we were having here, right? <laughs> I haven't done anything to CPU. Where did you run it on Scholar? On the CPU only? Well, this is before you went over so Oh, so he see Henry. This is what I was saying. So you went on Scholar, but you selected CPU only, not GPU, and you ran the code and I get point GPU, but I just didn't send it to GPU. So okay, and it runs a little bit slower then. How how long did it take you? Um, what's your username? I don't know. That's probably two days. No, I can look, I can, if you want, I can bring up the Q maybe. But um, I think maybe last week it took a few hours. Go ahead. A few hours. A few hours yeah. on, on Scholar, okay. With a GPU or a CPU? Sure. You're not sure, yeah. But it was a couple of hours to run how many epics? 15 or 11. 11 epics. That seems slow, yeah, 11. So you were probably on CPU then. Well, also the CNN. You build a very big CNN. Do you know, and I mean, a good score, right? Decent, above 50, let's say. Okay, yeah. And, uh, okay, that'd be interesting to know how you got yours to work because we've, we've been, is it GPU, MIG GPU, CPU? Um, it's, it's, it's probably GPU. He used a GPU. Yeah, he used a GPU. I would say hold up. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, he's a. Yeah, he had four sessions for fifteen minutes each. Fifteen minutes. Sure. That's the power of this admin. Four sessions, fifteen. Mm -hmm. He had four, four hours. 
uh, not four hours, um, four sessions, 15 minutes each. You all can. That's important. Yeah, that's okay. Um, the data set that you loaded, was it just that the the what the link you sit you downloaded the SIP and uploaded it and then uncompressed it, yeah, same, yeah. So same it's like very strange. The code is the one I provided, it's and you modified it. The the PyTorch code, yeah, yeah. So, hmm. you're the first person to report the. To achieve good results with uh scholars but, but you used like your own yeah a very he didn't build a complex environment right yeah slurm and everything yeah all right um yeah i don't know guys i mean but these are some suggestions i mean try cpu mig as i said Quentin, i may talk to you a little bit later and just kind of figure out what you did all right. Any questions, guys, on this? Sorry about this. I, I don't know. If I, I was hoping to have this fixed, but no one has been able to figure out what, what the issue is. Anything else? Now, for the other project, you can run it on laptop, right? That doesn't require a GPU, so you should be good to go. All right. Be any questions? No. All right. Before I uh, continue with the lecture today, are there any... Uh, any other question about anything? Nope. All right. So let's um let's get into it. So today I'm gonna if you remember last week I talked about MSE, right? The loss function for um for regression models. And today we're gonna talk about cross entropy, which is the other loss function. Okay, so I actually, I have the tablet, but I'm going to use my slides here. If you remember. Basically these, so I believe we've covered linear regression here. So we're just going to be covering these two. Right, so it's uh, here's the link that I provided, but I'm just gonna download these. All right, so we're gonna go over these again. Uh, these are the the notes that I discussed. So you can see the these are let me see which one i'm going to use first this is mostly the cross entropy one yeah and this one I, I like using this so this is basically if you notice it's a contrast of all the different models that you can have so for instance we've talked about linear regression models okay and then we've talked about mlps you guys know that we've done deep learning and there's something in in between there called logistic regression right but if you notice, what do they all have in common? They're all basically starting from the function w times x plus b. Do you see that? And that predicts a value. And then down here in blue, I wrote the loss function, right? So remember that what is happening is that you have two functions in machine learning, right? Two equations, if you, if you want to think of it that way, right? And we've gone over the theory a little bit. One equation does what? Given the x vector, it predicts a value, right? And that's the prediction of the model. Once that value is predicted, what do you do with that value? You give that to the other function, the loss function, and that function does what? It compares the predicted to the real, right? Calculates a difference, and based on that difference, it updates the weights. Do you guys see that? It's the same logic throughout, and that doesn't change. So basically all of these have the same thing. So what I wanna show is the contrast between them, how you're like literally building. So let's start, here. this is the perceptron. So this was in the, like the 1940s. And if you notice, it's basically the same thing, except that instead of producing 
values in a range from minus infinity to infinity, it just produced a zero or a one, just like two values of more discrete, basically. You see that? So this function was a, a function that just produced these two values, like a step function, for, for instance, zero or one. And you'll see that later. Then you have the linear regression, which is exactly the same. You give it an X. You got, remember, the W and the Bs are the parameters, the things that initially are going to be random. But these are the things that you're learning. When you see that loss going down, right, what's happening is the weights are being updated every time. Make sense? So in the linear regression, the Y produces a value from minus infinity to plus infinity. And that value is given to another function that compares it to the real value and it tries to minimize the error. Remember that? We covered that last week. And that we called MSE, sometimes known as the least squared errors. All of these are the optimization base. So this is what I discussed last week. Today, we're gonna discuss the other optimization or loss function called cross entropy. So I'm going to give you the theory behind that, the background, the intuition of how that works, right? But basically, just like before, we have two functions, right? This function and this function. These two functions, we usually call this one the inference function because you, you get an X and you predict something. And then you have the loss function over here, which is the, the update of the weights function. So in regression, we are predicting a value from minus infinity to plus infinity, but in other cases, when we're using cross entropy, we're going to be predicting the classes, all right? So this is the scenario of the class, okay? So there's two types of cross entropy, binary cross en entropy and multi-class cross entropy. So I will just discuss the binary cross entropy, but in the link that I provided, if you go to that document, there's a description for the multi-class cross entropy as well. They're very similar, but I think the uh, cross entropy binary is a lot easier to understand once you look at it. Not It's not that bad. Make sense? All right, so here, if you notice, we you know, before we jump, let's, we're going to think of the scenario of supervised learning and we're building classifiers, right? Something that predicts cat or a dog, something like that. We're going to progressively get to deep learning by first jumping to logistic regression then to multi-layer perceptron, then to deep learning. Okay. And they're gradually changing, but they're actually all coming from the same place. It's like they're, you know, like basically evolving from one. So in the linear regression, we have W times X plus B, and that produces a value from minus infinity to plus infinity, right? But in logistic regression, we're trying to predict classes. So that means that we are trying to predict zero or one, always. Whether we're just predicting for one neuron, or if we have like three neurons, like in the iris, where we had versicola, virginica, and the other one, right? We're just basically trying to predict like a probability that it's this class or this class or that class. But if you think about it, that value, if it's a probability, it's from zero to one. Does that make sense? Yeah. So whereas this one predicts from minus infinity as is, to make it predict from zero to one, all we have to do is notice here, Wx plus B is still the same there. That has not changed. But instead of Y, now we use the letter Z because you think of it as a stepping stone towards Y, right? So what we do with C is that you plug it into F and F produces Y. So these are the activation functions, such as the sigmoid that I was talking about. So the sigmoid will convert, is a function just like sines and cosines that converts a number from minus infinity to infinity to another scale from zero to one. Does that make sense? And I'll provide the equation in a second and also a graph of how that works. But for now, what I really want you to see is the contrast between all of these and how they're a little bit different. Any questions? Now, remember, the, this F that I'm changing here can be sigmoid, tan, H, the ReLU that you guys are playing with, all those different functions, right? But all they're doing is they're taking a value minus infinity to a range that is zero to one or minus one to one, or in the case of ReLU is what? Zero to positive, any positive number. Got it? Okay, now 
because it's classification, the optimization is no longer going to be MSE. What was M what did MSE look like? If you remember, it was that quadratic shape, right? We talked about that bowl shape thing, the quadratic curvy thing, right? That governed the relationship between the weights and something we called the loss, which is the thing that we were trying to minimize, okay? Now, instead of MSC and that shape, which was quadratic, we have a new equation called cross entropy, which creates a different shape, no longer quadratic, unfortunately. But at least the positive thing about this is that it's used in all scenarios. So actually cross entropy is used for the multi-layer perceptron, is used for the deep learning. If you look at your code, where I instantiate the loss, you'll see it says cross entropy loss, right? Hopefully you've seen that. That parameter is really important and it's this that I have highlighted here in blue. Make sense? Any questions so far? All right, so now let's jump from logistic regression to multi-layer perceptron so that we can see the difference. If you notice, what's the difference? It starts the same way. Just like this one is WX plus B, this is WX plus B. But multi-layer perceptron has a hidden layer, right? So that means that we produce C1. That C1 becomes the input to F. What is F? An activation function, such as sigmoid, tan H, relu, et cetera. You can try any of those. And the output of that becomes H1, right? That's the first hidden layer. So we have an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. That H1 then does what? Becomes the X, if you will, for the next equation. Notice we just copy this exact, equ exact equation over here, but now it's W2 times H1 plus B2 to produce C2. Do you see it's a, another function? Do you see that? What is that always? That NN dot linear. Whenever you use that function, NN dot linear in PyTorch, you're literally doing this. It's just a very easy way of doing all of it. It instantiates the weights, the biases, et cetera. And they are separate weights and biases. Got it? Now this H1 then, with this new set of weights, produces C2. And this C2 now goes into another F, which could be another ReLU, uh, sigmoid, whatever it is, another activation, and that produces Y. Okay, it's an MLB because we have one input layer, one hidden layer, and one output layer. Any questions? So you can see they're all very similar, right? They just have like additional constructs, et cetera, or they're becoming deeper. So the cross entropy is the same. The loss function is cross entropy. So now what about deep learning, right? Deep learning is the exact same as MLP, except that you're gonna repeat this H1 several more times and just label them H2, H3. So for instance here, I start again with W1, X plus B1. X is always obviously the input. That produces C1. This C1 goes into F, which is an activation function. That produces H1. H1 then times W2 plus B2 produces Z2. C2 goes into F, another activation of your choice. And that produces H2. And you can just continue doing that as deep as you want to get. In fact, like, the ResNet 101 has 101 layers of this, and they're actually convolutional layers, not just regular numbers. Got it? So, you know, we saw with the CNN that instead of using nn.linear, we use the conv2d, right? That's how what we change, basically. But otherwise, the idea is similar. Any questions on that? And so that the last step when you get CN goes into another activation, F that produces Y. Usually remember the last activation will most likely be a um, softmax operation, which I will show you today, a simple PyTor Python example of how that works. Got it? Do you guys understand the contrast? So this is an important thing because I'll probably ask you this question on the exam, on the final. It's literally like the one question that makes a lot of sense to ask, okay? Any questions? So yeah, please. Deep learning is just a multi-layer scan. Yes, exactly. Deep learning is literally just somebody said, let's add more layers. Let's just keep doing this. And because at the end of the day, you know, it's a function that goes into another function and that goes into another function. 
And when you take the derivatives, there's something called the chain rule that allows you to just keep adding functions within functions, and the chain rule allows you to take all the derivatives. So it works perfect. And the chain rule is just like the derivative of f of x is derivative of uh, f times root root the actually no. I just forgot. What was, what was Let, the I'll do it for you. Give me a sec. I have that here. I'm only showing you because Henry asked this question. All right, so let me, for this, I need to go to the thingy here. So basically, okay, so you know the backpropagation algorithm uh, by Rummel, Hart, Hinton, and Williams, published in Nature, 1986, like the fundamental paper that allows all of this to work. Without it, it would not work. It's based on something called the chain rule. The chain. Okay. So it's an approach basically to compute the derivative of a complex nested function, such as F, but where the input is another function, because that's really what neural networks are, right? We just showed it that we did a function and that plugs into the next one and then into the next one. Mathematically, this is the, the same definition, right? You see that? So this X went into G, the result of that plugged in here. Yeah, okay. So let me see, how do I create a new page? Okay, so now, so basically then if we have that, the, no, the notation of Y, oh, sorry, H1 equal, W1 X plus B, and then this becomes F or Y, sorry, of F H1, right? That's kind of a neural network, right? And you just keep doing that as I just showed before. This is equivalent to what I just wrote before, which is F of G X, which is the notation that you'll see associated with something like the chain rule. So the chain rule basically is an approach to compute the derivative of a complex nested function such as this as follows. So in calculus, you do, you know, you take the derivative of something like, for instance, x2. And when you take the derivative of this, it's going to be 2x. Like that. Right. So that's basically it's an operation, and you have different approaches, you know, you know, the, the d of this in terms of x. Okay, gives you that. So now the chain rule is basically can be written as follows. I'll show you. I'll show you. So it should be basically D, the derivative of D of X, which is the derivative of the whole thing, right? F GX. which is then gonna be, and this is what probably what you're asking, the derivative of F dg times the derivative of dg in terms of derivative of S. So you start building this to take these derivatives. So for instance, we can do something then, if you have many layers, you can say, if for, for many layers, you have, for instance, the final one, right, would be F of G of H of U of V of, you see, you see what's going on here? Seems kind of crazy, right? Hold, hold on, let me let me let me finish the parentheses here. There you go. All right, so that's a very deep neural network. But if you notice, that's the same thing as this one over here, right? So that this whole structure that we'd write like that is nested basically. And so what's the whiteboard? 
basically it becomes this, which now you can take the, so now this becomes, this becomes, I you know, you can break it down as the derivative of F in terms of X, which is gonna be uh, the derivative Here it is, of f in terms of g times the derivative of g in terms of dh times the derivative, oh, sorry, this should be an h. So this is h, and this is the derivative of h in terms of du, and this is the derivative of u in terms of dv, and then this is the derivative of v in terms of x. Do you see that? So you individually break all of these operations and then multiply them, and that's the chain rule, basically. But the, the thing is, you have the function, and you're deriving in terms of one of the terms, basically, that's going so this is calculus. I mean, it's, you know, so this would not be fun to implement um, by hand. It's not something you do. It's done in uh, the, the solvers like TensorFlow and PyTorch. That, but this, this is what they're doing behind the scenes. So this is the operation, right, that takes the derivative comes from this. But just keep in mind, this is exactly this architecture here because one value is going into the other. And so does that make sense? So, so it, after that, I mean, after this, what I, what I, what I would say is, I'm sorry. What after after this, you can go to any calculus book and solve it because there's a set of rules that basically define how to solve these operations. Okay, so that's basically the idea, and this is done efficiently. Any questions? Yeah. Anyway, so those are basically like things that are just done for us and we just take advantage of them. But without this, none of this would work. Like we wouldn't be able to do it. If we, yeah, Henry. Each time we multiply, we keep the inner layer in context. So it would be the outer layer of G, H, and then you would be the derivative. It's the derivative of that function in terms of that term, right? right. You know, like, um, I guess a basic example would be f of x. You would just take the derivative of f, the lead of, I'm sorry, f of g of x, g of, g of x untouched, by the derivative of the outside layer, you multiply that by the derivative of g of x. Would that be? I mean, Henry, I would just, without doing a problem, I, I'd have to look at it. But what I can tell you is if you arrive at this form, you can solve it and you know with calculus. This is this is the operation basically. But I'm not gonna take it beyond that. All right. So, but that's what it translates to that the architecture of the model translates into an operation like this in calculus that can be solved. I mean, if you want later on, we can look at a specific one. All right. But anyway, so so that's basically when you when you hear the chain rule, this is the idea that's going on. And I don't have an example. All right, so let's go back to the, uh, I'm going to close this. All right, so we are going back. Oh, let me actually make sure I'm sharing the screen. Okay, so basically then, as I was saying, we need to be, uh, create this architecture, right? And this architecture then needs to go into this, uh, the result of this function needs to go into the cross entropy function to compare with the real value, right? And as we're optimizing, every time that we're optimizing that function, whether it's small or big, very deep or, or, or small, we need to take those derivatives to know how to do the update. Remember the whole walk, you know, walking, towards the optimal, right? So that's the, the basic intuition that we need to have. But we have a cross entropy, which is a specific function 
that we need to define, right? So also before we move to that, let's just, this same contrast that I have here, let's compare it to neural networks, all right? So here is the architecture of the previous ones. So we've got, let's start basically with linear regression. This is the architecture, right? So we have the input layers to produce one output. The logistic regression, remember there's no hidden layers in that one. So it's just the input layer and the output layer like this, right? Then we have uh, the multi-layer perceptron, the previous one, which is one input layer, one output layer, and then one hidden layer. And then we have the activation uh, that is relevant basically, or something like that, and softmax at the end. Remember that the values come out like 0.7 and 0.3 because they add up to one because it's softmax. In this one, though, we don't have a softmax, so they could be 0.8 and 0.4. You see that? So that does not add up to one. And then for the deep neural network, basically notice we have an input layer, an output layer, and hidden layers in between, and that's the architecture of the network. Do you guys see that? Do you see the contrast? So hopefully this is what you draw. This is how you code it. And then uh, mathematically, did it delete it? I guess it's gone. I really don't like this one. But anyway, that was the, the mathematically, the representation of it. All right, so let's go back. All right, so we went over the architecture. Now, I keep talking about these activation functions, so here they are, right? So whenever you know you see that F that the input goes into, what is happening is you you know you you have these activation functions here, like you have a sign and you give it a value and then it produces another value. With the step function, for instance, what you the way that you should look at it is what is the value going to be for x in this other plane, right? So you have a value in x and what does it look like in y? And you have a function. So in the step function here, basically the value is either zero or one always and nothing else. Do you guys see that? So so like you're coming from over here, over here, over here, it's zero and then here and now becomes one. And that's called a step function. All it does is it changes from one to the other. Make sense? The sigmoid function is this one. And if you notice the same idea, you're coming from minus X to plus X, but it's going from zero one, but it can be also 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.3. So it's got that S shape, and that's a sigmoid function. Any value, notice, this is important. X here could be any value from minus infinity to plus infinity. It could be like five minus 1,000 minus 300 to 400 to 700. You know, all those values just always get mapped to zero and one because the function does that. You guys see that? Any questions about that idea? Tan H is this one. And if you notice, it's exactly like the sigmoid, except that the range is actually from minus one to plus one instead of from zero to one. Do you see that this is zero to one? This is minus one to plus one, okay? Softmax is like sigmoid, but values add up to one, all right? So that's basically the difference. So you get a a vector of different classes. Let's say like in Cypher 10, you have 10 values, a vector of 10. It's predicting 10 probabilities, but those should add up to one. And the function of softmax does that for you. I actually do have a code example for that one that's pretty short so that we can see it. Then we have ReLU here and Jellu, I didn't provide a graph for it, but ReLU, if you notice, it's the so-called hockey stick. So you can remember why, because it produces zero or a value that's positive. So for instance, if the values are minus 300, minus 100, minus five, it's always zero. But once you get to three, then the value is three. If the it's 50, the value is 50. That's why it's a hockey stick. So here it's linear, right? So if, if it's positive, it's that value basically. Got it? And that's the ReLU activation. 
And as you have seen, this one works really well in machine learning. Any questions about the activation functions? Nope. All right. Then we have one hot encoding, and I think you probably know what this one is already, right? So if I have, you know, cat, dog, bird, so then this is cat. You know, if I have a, you know, a class that's cat, then it's cat. And then I designate that this neuron represents dog, so then that one gets a one, and bird is the other one, right? So this is the real data, and then the predicted model basically wants to approximate this so that, for instance, the prediction, a good prediction would be for cat, 0 0.95, 0 0.02, 0 0.03. They add up to one. Do you guys see that? Okay. But you only achieve that with softmax, although in SciFAR 10, you can take out softmax and see what happens. I mean, sometimes these things you know, are not exactly 100% necessary as you can experimentally see it. Okay, but you know, but in general, these are good practices. All right, so yeah, I believe, yeah, this is the part. Uh, yeah, I think I've talked about this last week. This is how we, the MSC, right? So I'll do a quick review of this. Uh, basically, you're trying to learn a linear function. So this is regression with MSC. And classification is also a line that you're trying to predict, but the line separates samples from X and, and samples from from the other, you know, samples from one class and the other class. So it's basically a line, but with a different objective. And that's what's really important. Then that objective is captured, believe it or not, by cross entropy. That's the beauty of cross entropy, okay? Which we will discuss in a second. So I talked, to, I, I guess I'm just repeating this. So the regression I told, told you is you got the loss function there. It's quadratic. So I'm reminding you of the shape of it. And remember, it's two functions and two graphs. So this inference function is this line, this graph. This function, j, is this one, the, the difference between the real and the predicted squared. Remember that this difference squared gives us this quadratic bowl shape. Does that make sense? That's really important. And that, you know, by just walking, if you will, through this curve and going down, you you are you know not guaranteed, but you will find a loss, you know, a good set of values, basically. Got it? All right. So that's the loss one. And now we are ready for the cross entropy. You know, we want to think of it in terms of the previous one, right? So how does cross entropy work? So cross entropy is actually this very scary looking equation right here. Okay. First of all, pretty scary. I admit, it's very scary. I have a better uh, set of graphs on my link. So we'll go to that in, in a little bit. So some nice pictures. But for now, think of it as what's the inference here? So Wx plus B equals Z. But now it will go through an F function, which is something like a sigmoid or something like that, because you want to predict zeros and ones. Do you guys see that? That's basically zero and one right there. So your inference, that's the only change. Like you just added that function to make it in, instead of regression, any real valued number, just a value between zero and one, like a probability of a class, okay? So what does the loss function look like? So the loss function cross entropy is this one actually. So one way of thinking about it is that you actually have two cases. If the real, this is the real value by the way. So if y equal one, like when, remember that when you're doing the loss function, what do you do? You take the predicted and the real, do you agree? You always have the real because you're comparing it to the predicted. So think of it as an algorithm that says, if the real is one, then I'm going to choose this equation. If, and this is, again, for the binary case only, right? And if the y is zero, then I'm going to select this equation. Do you guys see that? So these two functions, which is minus log, and then this g of the predicted, and this is one minus g of the predicted, right, is basically the cross entropy, OK? Those equations actually give you these uh, graphs. So basically, when you use y equal 1, you don't use the other one. Do you see that? So if the real value is 1, you use this one here. 
this graph. Just like we use quadratic over here always, now we use this one. And if y is equal to zero, then we use this graph over here. And that's the graph that we want to minimize. We make use of this equation because it effectively allows us to update the weights to obtain good results. Why is, why is it that we choose these equations? Well, notice here, if, if the real value is y, sorry, if the real value is one, what do we want the predicted value to be? One. In this graph that is governed by this equation here and none other, and it always looks like this, like always, always. In relation to this axis here, right? When is this function minimized or optimized? The error, right? So we want it to be one. And this is basically what we want. We want it to be one, right? So basically then we are, if we are, let's say here at this point, right? Then it's closer to zero. The real value is closer to zero. So when we compare it to one, what happens? It's not a match. Do you see that? When is it a match? When we when we start going down, right? And we get to this point here, this equation basically uh, will minimize the cost when the value, the predicted value is one. You see that basically here. Does this make sense, guys? Now think of the other case, right? Let's say that the real value is zero, right? The real value is zero. So then we choose this equation. So if we fall here, right? When is it minimized? When it, you know, the cost is zero. And when is the cost zero? When the value is closest to zero. So this is why we use crisscross entropy, quite simply. Okay, so think of it as a choice of some equation out of hundreds of thousands of equations probably that meets the condition that we want. That when we want a, a real, when our real value is one, we want our predicted value to also be one. And by gradient descent, if we keep going down, right, we're going to start getting closer to it being one because that's what we're trying to optimize. On the other end, when we're here, right, uh, when the value is zero, right, and we fall anywhere on the curve, gradient descent basically means that we just keep going down in this equation, and we are almost guaranteed to, to reach the, the best result when we're closest to zero, because going down means getting close to the zero. Do you guys see that? That's the cross entropy, exactly like that. Just like quadratic creates that curve, Cross entropy creates these two curves that are dependent on the sim on the real label. Okay, all right. So this is kind of the intuition. So let's keep going here. Uh, we can skip this part for now. So let's go. Yeah. So let's go over here. So this is continuation. All right. So we're in contrast, right? Looking at the difference between linear regression and logistic regression. Remember linear regression like this, logistic regression, another line, but separating the red from the purple, okay? Another way of thinking about the equate, I, although I don't like this representation, this is basically cross entropy, right? With the two curves, but just imagine that you have to choose one or the other. Right, you can't use both. But in in what I in both cases, what's important is the mechanism that you're using. The mechanism is very the analogy is almost very real. Think of it as a mountain. And the goal on these mountains is to go down. Another way that you can think about it, you guys are familiar with video games, right? You you, you use video games all the time, right? When you, yeah, there's, there's a video game, right? So there might be a video game of scaling a mountain, right? Going up or down. So you're a, a character, you scale down the mountain or you go up the mountain. What is the mountain? It's not a real mountain. It's just some code and some functions, right? This is, the, think of it exactly like that. 
these equations just create this behavior, right? That has a curvy behavior or these that are not curves, but they're just like going slanting down. So the optim the gradient descent basically just tries to st take steps only on these curves and nowhere else. But it needs to know if it should go up or down, right or left. You see that? Yeah, go ahead. And what's the momentum? Of what? This, it's just a step size here. Okay. So that all we're using that like the 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 movement, how you move down is the step size, basically, which is the learning. All right, so, and then remember the, the derivative thing has to do with at a specific point in these curves, whether it's this one or this one, you take the derivative of the function in terms of that parameter, right? And at that point, it's just gonna tell you positive or negative, which allows you to update the weight, weights at that point in time. Do you guys see that? Does that make sense? So I, I would say very much think of these curves as just mountains in a video game and then the procedure to go down on, on them. So in this case, again, I'm, I'm reminding you, you have linear regression, the inference function with its plot, and then you have the loss function, which is real minus, minus predicted. And this equation has this behavior. It creates that mountain, and you fall on that mountain and you go down on that mountain. With cross entropy, you have this one over here, right? So in logistic regression, for instance, which is the simplest case, we use cross entropy, which can be binary and multi-class, as I said. Multi-class is just a variant. Currently, I'm only discussing the binary case, but there's the inference. W times X plus B gives Z. C goes into sigmoid to produce the Ys. This is the, basically you can think of it as a line separating the points and then the cross entropy is the two charts that I talked about. Here's the equation again. And if you notice the equation can actually be, the, the two ifs, if you will, can actually be put together for convenience into one single equation, J, all right? Which is what you're gonna derive. So if you think about it, so cross century binary, right? So this function log and, and all that creates those shapes. Now, putting them together creates this equation that has both components together. But this still works if you think about it and you just have to think why. All right, so let's assume the first case, right? If the real class Y is equal to one, plug it in that equation and tell me what happens, right? So Y, is one, right? Which is this Y right here. So Y one, one times this gives you that term, right? Which is log G W X plus B, no problem. But I plug also the Y here, one minus one is what? Zero, correct? So what happens to this term over here? It goes away. Do you see that? Does that make sense, guys? And over here, if Y, if, if on the other hand, the real value is y equals zero, then what happens? You plug zero here and what happens to this term? Goes away, you plug in zero here, one minus zero is one, so this term stays. So you should convince yourself that this is for the y zero and this is for the y one. You guys see that? So if effectively you have two figures instead of just one that you're selecting and that basically think of it as you're creating this mountain and all your, your values falling in this mountain and now gradient descent says, go down. That's you know not guaranteed, but this is the procedure. The goal is to go down, not up in these functions. Okay? So that creates these two graphs over here, which I have drawn them again. So one is the the log one minus G, right? Log one minus G. And the other one is the log G, which is this one. See that? So basically these functions are just like if you were a computer uh, a game designer and somebody tells you draw this mountain for this case, imagine you would draw this, you would write this equation, effectively you created that mountain. Or you create a mountain that looks like that one, then you use this equation. 
But what's great about it is this, then you can put your points there, follow gradient descent down, and you're guaranteed to achieve your objective because your objective is, if it's a, if it's a here in this case, right? If it's a Y equal real, then the predicted Y will be optimal here at this point where this value is one. You guys see that? Does this make sense? This is just a result of, of the whole thing. But remember that to get the final result, you change all the parameters. Questions? Make sense? Does this make sense? All right. And then the other scenario is here, right? So if Y is equal to zero, then uh, this equation is the one that creates this mountain, this relationship, right? And so basically you you're going to change all these W's, et cetera. But at the end of the day, right, what you want to do is you want to predict something that's a zero. Why? Because this mountain, you know, this lowest point is when it gets closest to zero, right? And because the real value is zero and your predicted value is zero, and that's what you want. That's it. Oops. It's doing its thing. But that, that's it, it's it's literally that simple, right? So you just have to think of it as that's what these equations do. They govern the relationship between the inputs, the weights, et cetera, and the predicted value. And what they tell you is the cost of it. You know, the, and you're trying to minimize it. You minimize cost when the value is one here and the real is one, so that's what you want. And you minimize cost here when the value is zero, and that's what you use when the real value is zero. That's pretty much cross entropy. Any, oh, sorry. Any, any questions on this one, this idea? It's a little bit, the, I know the equation looks hard, but actually the concept is very simple. All right, all right. Okay, so this is another uh, version of sigmoid basically, right? So all it does is it takes a value from minus infinity to plus infinity and creates a value from zero to one. Here is sigmoid again, and you can see here I have another example. So if it's minus three, right, it's close to zero. If, as it gets three or above, it becomes close to one and so on. Okay, and these are the activation functions of your models. Basically. Any questions? No questions. All right. So these were my notes from, um, and that they're on uh, Brightspace, right? So you guys can take a look at them. So we're gonna just code a little bit now. A few, a few exercises that I have just to kind of bring these ideas a little bit more uh, concrete. Okay. So let me, let me actually make sure I'm sharing. Hopefully. Okay, so I do wanna show, I do have better graphics in this. Um, what I added it's links. Yeah, this is actually what we're going to cover in a, the, the, the thing I'm going to cover now. I thought... Man, these are PDFs. Where did I put them? Huh. I would swear that I did this.
Hmm. All right. I will add them. I'm sure I, I did this, but anyway. Okay. So I'll just go here. I'll add these later to the here. But if you, if you, if you remember, I, I'm pretty sure I added these, but I don't know where I put them. All right. So this is basically the same stuff I've been saying. So if you want to read this in more detail, you can read through this link. It goes over, you know, everything. I just want to point out kind of motivation. So, you know, neural networks, right? And their architectures and examples with PyTorch. The linear regression equation and intuition, right? So there's linear regression. Um, then here, somewhere in here is cross entropy. All right, so this is basically the what I described today. So these are my notes. You can read through this example if you'd like. This is you know the logistic regression algorithm. This is an example with housing prices. So basically everything that I just said, you can take a look at it. And then this is the function for the softmax that we will cover in a little bit. This code example is basically softmax. So one of the activations, this is the architecture for a logistic regression algorithm. And this is what I just described. So cross entropy, in particular, I just described binary cross entropy, right? So the example I just gave you, so you can see this is just written a little bit better. Uh, you can see the same thing. If the real value is one, then that's the equation. If the real value is zero, then that's the equation, okay? And this is another way of writing it basically. And that translates into these two graphs over here. I guess I'm going to show them individually, but basically it's the same idea. So if Y, the real value is one, you choose one of the equations. One of the equations gives you this curve. And basically in that curve, taking gradient descent takes you down here, basically, right? And you can see that when you get to here, the value starts to approximate. Does that make sense? And then in the other case, when the real value is zero, you use the other equation. The other equation creates this graph. And basically, right, if you take gradient descent in that equation, the you you optimize the loss when the value, the predicted value starts to approximate zero, which is what you want, because the real is zero and the predicted is zero. Remember that the predicted is in terms of the function that you're learning. Does that make sense, guys? And so that is basically what I just said before, but you know, my write-up of it. And then here's the same equation put together, same idea. Now, I only covered binary cross entropy. I leave it to you guys. I won't include this in the exam, but if you're curious about multi-class cross entropy, so obviously you use cross entropy for predicting CIFAR 10, right? CIFAR 10 has 10 classes, not two classes. So the scenario I gave you of this is binary cross entropy. What you have to do now is a multi-class cross entropy, you can read through this and it shows an example of how it is computed basically. All right, but I'm not gonna include it on the exam. Okay. And put that you know for you to read. All right. And that's basically uh, everything else uh, you can read through of how the networks tie to the diagrams and so on. So you can read through this whole chapter. It's very similar to a lot of what we did for the Cypher 10 challenge. Any questions, guys? Does that make sense? Cross entropy? Are there anything, any doubts on how it works? All right. So again, you know, you only need uh, these loss functions for, um, to only have two, MSC for regression and then cross entropy for classification. And that's basically it. A transformer such as, you know, Chad GPT, et cetera, was trained with cross entry. So there is no magical new thing or anything like that. I literally have the code for that. I know exactly. You know, the code, is, something like Chad GPT, the code is available. I have it. It's on my GitHub, actually. That's not the problem. I wish that was the problem. The problem is 
the amount of data I need and the amount of GPUs I need to train such a thing. But the code is right there. All right. Anyway, so that I think concludes my notes. And what I want to do now is I have some examples um, on that we're going to cover. And so I'm going to bring up the... We have some time, so I'm going to bring up... I'm going to go here. All right, so actually here, neural nets, we're going to go to PyTorch, which is where Cypher 10 and everything lives. And basically, I just have um, foundations of neural networks, gradients, and egg, and I have this other one of computing gradients. So I have two scripts uh, that I'm going to show you. Basically, you know, I don't think I can cover every detail of them today, but I leave it to you to have play with these, okay? I, but they're basically what? They're the calculus part of all of this. All right, so how do you calculate the gradients and, and all that connection, okay? So I'm just gonna show you where they are and kinda, um, you know, we can discuss it basically. So this one, Foundations of Neural Networks, Gradients and XOR is one of the scripts, okay? This works fine, but you know, I, I just, in the interest of time, I'm only going to talk about it. And you guys can run it on your own. So this is one, okay? So I'll talk a little bit about it. And then I have the other one. I'll close, I think I can close this. So, yeah, so I did, so all right. So I open foundations of, I'm gonna close this as well. Okay, so I've I've opened this script, right? Foundations of neural networks, gradients, and XOR. I definitely want to cover this one. And the other one is this one, gradients, this link here. So both of them are a similar concept. Um, I'm going to skip this part because it's not really relevant, but I'm going to start like discussing it around here, like right there. All right, so this is now uh, the same idea I was talking about like in, in notes and everything, but in PyTorch, right? So we're looking at it and kind of getting a feel for how this works. So let's take a look at, at this one first, uh, the training process and stochastic gradient descent. So this is the technique that allows us to learn the weights Okay, uh, so now we can look at gradient descent so we can learn the weights, right? You know, that's basically the idea. Okay, so this is motivation of the algorithm using the quadratic function. So if you remember, the quadratic function looks like that, right? And I have created this function this time around with an actual PyTorch function. So how did I do that? I created this. If you notice here, I define a function f that takes in some parameter w. And what do I do to that parameter, basically? I square it. You see that w? The two uh, asterisks here just means racing to the power of, right? So squaring it, basically. All right, so that's, that's the function. You should convince yourself that that w is what? y real minus y friend gives you that w. And then I created uh, values in the x-axis. So this x-axis here, I created values from minus two to two, and I wanted nine of them. All right, so now that I have these values, this gives me a list. I print that x, and it gives you minus two, 1.5, all the way to two, right? So what do I do now? You know, all I, all I need to do is I'm going to plot the x vector and the x vector in the f function so that whenever I give it one of the values from x, it gives me the, the result after it runs through the function, the y. You guys see that? So I'm effectively doing, if it's 0, it's 0. If it's minus 1, it's 1. If it's 1, it's 1. You see that? That's basically what I'm doing. So I created the quadratic function here. I created the line space. 
and now I'm able to plot. And this is basically, I just want to show you so that you can see the whole process in PyTorch. Okay, so I'm plotting it. Now comes the calculus part. All right, so calculus basically just means get in, getting the derivatives, e.g. what people call the gradients, because it's really always this analogy of going down this mountain. So that's analogy. So in deep learning, gradient usually means the value of a function's derivative at a particular argument value, such as the weight. The focus, and this is key, the focus is also on the variable and not the function. So, you know, which is counterintuitive. So when you do this in the analytical form, x squared gives you 2x, and you remember the function itself. That's the derivative of it. But in PyTorch and in these models, really what's being stored is a value, you know, in the in the weight itself, right? That you're trying to compute at that instance in time. So let's let's do that. So you can see here, I have the function w square, right? And now I'm going to create, <laughs> I'm going to take the derivative of it. But I take the derivative in, in an odd way, right? By doing the following. This is the value xt, right? That's going to go into f. Do you see that? So I create this variable xt. It goes into f to produce a y. This f is defined here, right? And that's basically like our neural network. Think of this as our neural network and think of this as the value that we're gonna try to update at a specific point in time. So we need to say, now in this case, not only did I initialize it to tensor, but I also initialize it to a value, three, just because, right? So we can do the exercise. In Torch, since you're creating a computational graph, you have to tell it that this value requires grad. And what that means is whenever you invoke a certain function in PyTorch, it's going to take the derivatives of that value at that point in time for that function. It just does it, right? Using the have, yeah. Okay. And grad out does all the derivative magic, right? Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm going to show right now. So I created the function and I'm creating that it requires grad, right? So notice the gradient association now from grad fn. So uh, I, I print it and I get nine. Why do I get nine? Because the input is three and what I'm, I'm running it through this function and three squared is nine. Perfect, right? So it's nine. So I get my nine, but that's the normal function. Remember that we also need the derivative of that function so that we can estimate the value of the update of the weight, right? So we, we have to take that derivative. So currently, you know, we know that it's assigned to grad fn and we are we haven't taken the derivative. Now we tell PyTorch to calculate the gradients, all the gradients, right? And that's when we do remember those three heavy lifting functions, uh, zero out the grads, backward and step. We always do that in the loop, right? You remember that? That's always in the in the training loop. Well, here I'm only invoking one of them, dot backward. But when I do this dot dot backward, it's not going to update anything, but it does calculate the gradients for everything. And, and notice what I mean here. When I do backward and now I print xt dot grad, this one over here, right? Notice what happens is that I get six instead of what I was getting before, right? So this basically tells you that it's it's calculated the derivative. So you can see here in math, the function is x squared. The derivative is 2x, right? So the variable x equal 3 plugged into the derivative function gives you 6 because it's 2 times x, which is 2 times 3. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? So you had one original function. And it's almost like when you do that uh, backward, now you have this new function, 2x, the derivative of x2. And then now the value is given in terms of that one and not the original. Any questions? That's what it's doing, basically. And so whenever you do this um, backward, it calculates these, and then it does the step, which does the update on the weights. Any questions? 
Okay, so you have the same example. Obviously, we never just use one variable. We use many variables, but we can use a vector such as this one, 3, 4, and 10, right? Here, notice the function has changed a little bit. So now the vectors are squared and then sum. So I leave this to you guys as an exercise. Print all these values, play with them, but convince yourself. So here, first we just run the vector through the normal function. Then think of it as running the same vector, but through the derivative of the function. And how do you get the derivative of the function even though you never see it? Because you run backward, basically. And it, it computes it for you, okay? So now when we run this, we got 3, 4, 10 that goes in there. That's 125, right? That, you know, if you square these and sum them, it should give you that. And then these should be the derivative uh, values of it, 2x, right? So 10 times 2 is 20, 4 times 2 is 8, and 3 times 2 is 6. Do you see that? x2 versus 2x. Got it, guys? So anyway, so that's kind of the idea. Now I want to show you here this, right? So these two graphs, I want you to play with these and pay attention. Notice that. This is again, what? Our quadratic function, right? I'm using the so-called MSE, right? So this one over here, which is just W square, right? So notice that, but, it, but at the bottom here, I'm plotting now two graphs. This is the quadratic and this is the derivatives. And what do you notice about these derivatives? If you compare them to this side, right? Notice, here, the value is zero, right? So these are negative values. These are positive values. Okay, so if you're on this side, it's telling you they're negative so that you go in this direction. And if you're on this side, it's telling you they're positive to go in this side. Do you see that? So what I'm going to do here is, and I encourage you guys to play with this one, is I'm going to run the whole training loop, but I'm going to print the, the, the gradient that's being calculated based on you know, the where we are in the equation. And I did it sequentially like this. So I, you know, it's a very simple, yeah. Do you have a question? Yeah, is that the derivative of the derivative? Just one derivative. So it should be just whatever the gradient does. How about that? Because I'm not actually taking the derivative. I'm just using the backward step. So it's PyTorch doing what it always does for the neural net, if that makes sense. So if you take a look over here, you can see the example basically. So all of what all of what I did before, I'm repeating, but now I'm repeating in a uh, I should have a for loop. Yeah, I have a for loop here. Okay. So basically, then notice that I rewrite a few things, right? I rewrote a few things. So instead of writing just x squared, now I have done the actual loss. Y pred minus y real, take the difference of them, square them but you should be kind of understanding that it's the same idea, okay? So I've rewritten that one. So I, I just wrote here, now we use xt grad to adjust the weights, right? Remember also that the weights would be adjusted such as that, right? So w equals w minus whatever the derivative is times the learning, and you make the update. And what's critical is that you wanna know the sign of this one here. Does that make sense, guys? So now uh, here again, uh, we have to have actual terms. So before we only had one value, now we have X and W, right? So we have an, a WT and an XT. So XT, notice it's just a value two. In this case, it does not have gradient associated with it. Why? Because we don't care about the gradient for X, right? We only care about the gradient for W. Why? Because W is the thing that we actually need to update. So we need derivatives for that one so that we know if it's going to be a plus or a minus. Make sense? Keep in mind, what we do the update is dot step, and I'm not using dot step here. All right, so now I'm creating this, W times X. No B, just to simplify it. What is that one? The inference function, okay? It's the inference function. So to predict Y pred, I also just hard-coded y real, a one, just to make things simple. 
And then I'm going to plug y real and y pred into loss, which invokes this function. And believe it or not, just by doing that, I've created a computational graph that will take the derivatives as they should be taken. Okay. So now, basically, uh, I do the loss over here and I just print some value for the first run. If you notice, once I do loss backward, so notice that now I'm not using backward of X, but I'm using backward of this loss, right? This loss captures everything. It's like the one node that captures all the connections in the computational graph. Do you see that? So we take the derivative in terms of that, and you can see that it is a different value, and it is, in fact, a negative value. And that's what you're going to use to update that weight for that particular instance. Make sense, guys? Any questions about this idea? I'm just extending this to what the loss does. Okay, there's w, WT. Now uh, I kind of create, because uh, I wanted to plot this, right? So I create a new linear space from minus four to four, right? That's going to be, um, you know, you can see it right, right here, minus four to four, and I'm using it exactly down here, okay? So basically then, once I have this space here, I'm going to now run the loop, that familiar loop that we always do, right? So I rewrote the function again, loss, y real, y pred, difference squared, right? I got these lists just to keep track of the values. And then for item in W, what is W? Linear space. So I'm literally just iterating from minus four to four. But as I'm doing that, I'm gonna be plotting those values in the quadratic function. And I'm only, I'm also going to give you the gradient equivalent of them. Do you guys understand that? I'm, I'm running in a loop from minus four to four. Do you see that? And I'm gonna plug the values into the quadratic and as you can see, it's a quadratic, right? Do you see that? But I'm also plotting as I'm doing this, the derivative of it, value, the equivalent value, and notice they're negative and positive, right? Because it's telling you the direction to take, basically. Notice that negative here for this side, and once you're at this side, is positive, and I guess if you're on this side, is zero. You see that? Because you've achieved the optimal. Okay, so we can take a look at it in the code here. So basically, I iterate through all those values. I, you know, I require the grad for W here. I plug in item into that, right? I grab some random X, do the computation, W T times X T. I initialize Y real to some value, it doesn't really matter. Plug those into loss. I, I add all the values here. And what's important is I take the backward of loss. Do you see that? So now WT, when I print it here, is actually the derivative of that function at that point in time. Okay. Does that make sense? And then the beauty of this is as I'm doing all these things and printing them, you can see basically that I'm in the quadratic function, but I'm also getting the gradient and it's telling me what direction to take. So if I'm, it's almost like this. If I, let's say I fell here, right? Then it's telling me that it's a negative value. And if I fell here, it's telling me that it's a negative value. If I fall here, it's a zero. It, on the contrary, if I'm over here, it's telling me that it's a positive value. And with that, I can control the direction I move to optimize, and that's gradient descent, basically. Does this make sense? Any questions on this idea? Okay, all right, so it seems like you guys get it. So that's one of the scripts I wanted to cover. I encourage you to play with this, right? And run it on your own, make your own experiments. The other one I wanted to cover, it's very similar. I, I've done similar things. Um, I did write in this one, 
the actual derivative for those of you that like to do that, although I don't have the chain rule, you can, Henry, Eric, you guys can double check there. Uh, so I encourage you to go through this script, but it's basically the same idea as before, you know, compute the gradients. So I guess we have seven minutes, so let's go through it a little bit. So here we have, um, this is a function. Yeah, so this this is similar, but it's it's the same idea. You have the values and you take the difference between these. See, these are a whole bunch of equations, right? So this is Z, if you notice, is W times X plus B, because it is torch mole W times X plus B is the same inference function as the previous example. That gives you Z. This is just basically a real value. You compare them and square them and sum them. It's very similar to the previous one, just in a different, uh, uh, written up differently and then basically again you take the backward which basically calculates the gradients for the things that you asked to be calculated right like this one you want b to require grad here okay and also w probably has required grad do you see that so for these values you know i guess that the key concept to understand in pytorch is that you create these graphs of tensors and operations and you link everything together and then when it's in memory and you take the the backward step what it does is for all of them it calculates the, the derivatives and it stores that information in the variables themselves okay so this exercise as i said you can if you want to work through it i provided the the actual equation so you can do the analytical solution as well and this is this should be the the actual implementation of this equation, but in PyTorch. Okay, so you can just double check. All right. Um, so this is the XOR problem. We didn't really have time for this one, but I encourage you to play with it. So I'll just kind of lay it out as a fun exercise. You don't have to do homework or anything like that. Um, but basically, what is XOR? It's a data set that shows you that there are some problems that you can only solve with neural networks, okay? And they cannot be solved with linear models. So for instance, here, I've created the data set right there. That's the XOR problem. So if I plot this data set, what you should see is this. Samples that are orange and samples that are green. There is no line that separates this perfectly, right? There's no line, you know, that can perfectly separate the orange from the green. Do you agree? Or do, or do you guys see a line that can I do this, you know, errors, errors, errors. Yeah, even if you like pull a coin to something, you're still gonna, it's not linearly separable at all. It's not linearly separable at all. Right, so if you apply process, uh, sorry, if you apply logistic regression, some linear, some line, right, you would not be able to solve it. Neural networks will be able to draw and perfectly separate, but only neural networks can do that. And the XOR exercise is for that. So. Basically, I've created the data set here and plotted it, but I don't have a, the neural network for it, at least not in PyTorch, to solve this one. And the XOR problem was originally made for the perceptron, right? It might have been, yeah. But it, it, if it's a linear model, there's no way. There's no way. But I guarantee you that if you throw deep learning at this, for it, and, and deep learning, by the way, and I'll close with this, needs to be... You know, here's the history of the perceptrons and every a lot of the things that we've covered. So I 
So just this last blurb here, basically. Things, however, things change radically once the network contains at least one hidden layer with SIGMOLD or other nonlinear activation functions. Such, such a network can indeed perform nonlinear classification and approximate arbitrary functions, but doing so may require adding vastly more units of the network. All right, so basically, um, you read through this. I kind of recommend that you read through this whole thing of what is an actual neural network, right? But I would say in conclusion that a neural network is something that has at least two hidden layers with activation function. And if you have such a thing, in theory, according to something called a universal approximation theory, you can approximate any function in the world. And that means any function, including his brain and your brain and that brain. And this is true, All right? This so the back and focus of the whole entire course. This is the, yeah, actually this, this actually is very important. Read through this from like over here. I talk about the perceptron a little bit. A lot of these concepts we've talked about. I, I just didn't have this time this semester, but I like to ask this question. What exactly is a neural net? This might be on the exam also, but I will tell you, it's basically at least two hidden layers for sure, with, but with activation functions. If you have 10 hidden layers between the input and the output, is that a neural network? Yeah. No. Because it doesn't have an activation. I thought you meant that, like, oh, what if it has... It uh, has... It, my point is, the point of this is, you could put in... It's not the depth. It's not 30 layers, right? It's layers and activations. If you have those things, it has been proven, and you can read all these papers, right? All these papers. Uh, but basically, then you're guaranteed... Somehow, you're guaranteed that these functions can approximate anything. In fact, actually, you can have input layer, output layer, and maybe just two hidden layers, but with tons of neurons. And that might approximate everything in the world. But what's the problem with that? Nobody wants to have two hidden layers with a million neurons each. Right. So it's better sometimes to have a hundred layers with a thousand neurons each than one or two layers with a million neurons each. You see what I'm saying? So that's better in terms of like processing power. All right, guys, so that's all the time we have for the semester. Unfortunately, uh, on Thursday, um, I, I'm going to help you out with your projects. If you're stuck with anything, I encourage you again to use Colab or light, light, lightning.ai or keep trying Google Scholar um, or your own laptop CPU. Maybe we'll fix this problem, but I don't know. I haven't received any any emails from West Lafayette. All right. I can contact. Them. Yeah, if you can, that I would really appreciate that. All right. I need to, like something. Yeah. Because I need to save my pretty much. Yeah, just give me a sec. So on Thursday again, I encourage you to come to class, but it's me for to help you out. Presentations next Tuesday and Thursday, sci-fi challenge, and also your project. Got it? Any questions? All right, guys, so we'll stop here for today.